I'm a low talker, so I'm going to wait for this. Oh. Okay, so uh, you can hear me. So I, I want to introduce our colloquium speaker for today. This is Dr. Garrett Cole. Um, he's a, a co-founder and CEO of uh, a company whose technology we'll hear about today, Crystalline Mirror Solutions, um, a precision optics company in Santa Barbara, California. Um, Garrett uh, and I actually go way back. Uh, we met <laughs> at, a, at a bar, in fact. Uh, I was looking this up today. So I remember in, in 2008 in Ventura, um, uh, at the time, actually, and I didn't know this at the time, he'd recently graduated from uh, UC Santa Barbara, where he had uh, done work in uh, John Bauer's group uh, developing, I guess, the first wavelength tunable uh, uh, Vixel-based optical amplifier. Um, he had uh, actually parlayed that research experience after spending some time in a startup and at, and at Lawrence Berkeley Lab um, into a postdoc at the University of uh, Vienna in the group of Marcus Aspelmeyer, where he was developing some very clever techniques to uh, fabricate uh, low-loss micromechanical resonators uh, directly into uh, high-reflectivity uh, crystalline uh, dielectric coatings. And this technology actually led to some of the very early work in efficient radiation pressure cooling of micromechanical oscillators, and eventually to the field which I work in, and he ostensibly also worked in, of uh, quantum optomechanics. So, uh, so I didn't know this at the time. All I know is that uh, there was this guy uh, across the bar from me, across the table, in fact, who was kind of preparing to steal my thunder because he was also from California but hailing from Europe, and uh, because he... Uh, at least professed to know a lot about how to build high finesse optical cavities, which was why big expertise as a, uh, as a, as a graduate student. And uh, to make a long story short, we got into a really heated argument about how to uh, assemble uh, an optical cavity. And I think at the end of that night, we were the only peop people sort of sitting at this table together. Um, and, I, and I won't repeat uh, the sort of blasphemous things that I thought that Garrett was a saying about uh, hand a, how to handle a super mirror at the time because they're sort of young optic students in the, in the audience and I don't want to, to lead them astray. And I, and I must say that he admitted that <laughs> he admitted he was wrong to me five minutes ago. Um, but the other reason I don't want to say that is, uh, is because uh, in the long run, I, I think that uh, if, if I had won that small battle with Garrett, it, it's uh, quite clear to me that he's, he's won the war. Um, I think over the last, uh, I guess, nine years since we've met, I've really come to uh, deeply admire the work uh, that Garrett does. He's managed to uh, parlay again this technology he developed in Vienna um, towards uh, developing a whole new sort of uh, type of uh, precision uh, mirror technology, which has the potential to really revolutionize a lot of applications in precision interferometry. So I always call Garrett my sort of... Uh, uh, optics hero in a way. He's not just my contemporary, but he's the guy that builds the superior super mirror. And uh, with that, I'd like you uh, to explain what that means uh, for yourself. Thank you, Garrett. Yep, thank you very much, Dal. That is by far the most fantastic introduction I've ever received uh, at a talk. So things are starting out on a good note. Um, Dahl mentioned this to some people and, and uh, reminded me when I got here. This is my second time visiting Tucson. And last time I was here was for a conference where actually two people unfortunately passed away. So my goal today is to have zero casualties in this uh, discussion. That's a morbid joke to make, but it really, it really tainted my first visit to Tucson. So I'm hoping for it to be a much more positive uh, experience this time. Um, so yeah, as Dahl mentioned, my name's Garrett Cole. I'm the co-founder of this company, Chris Lemire Solutions. We're admittedly an extremely niche, <laughs> somewhat esoteric uh, startup. But uh, we've developed some, some interesting technology. And the basic idea is rather than direct deposition, we take very high quality single crystal semiconductor films, so epitaxially grown multilayers, and uh, we, we use a substrate transfer bonding process to apply them as an optical interference coating. And uh, I'll go through all the details of why that's interesting in the course of the talk. I'm going to start out at the beginning with just a couple quick slides, like just rapid fire stuff about the company. I don't want this to be like a commercial or marketing talk, and it's going to be primarily technical. But just to give a quick overview of the company, also, if, if it's not an entrepreneurially focused talk, but if anyone has questions about starting a company, ask me. I have lots of things to do and things not to do. Like, don't start an international startup that has uh, locations on two different continents. 
um, and make your customers prepay for stuff. We've never done that, and that is a, still a huge mistake. This will be on YouTube, and then all my customers are going to come scream at me. But anyways, um, so from a big picture point of view, the basic concept is really merging uh, these, these two sort of disparate fields. Semicond there's extremely high quality semiconductor materials, semiconductor microfabrication processes, and traditional bulk optics. And I think there's a lot of overlap between these, these two areas, but th there's not a, you don't really see this come together in a sort of single device or sort of single um, sort of uh, focus area. So what we do is we grow with uh, leveraging you know, 40, 50 years of, of epitaxial growth development. We grow uh, ultra high purity, single crystal gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide multilayers, uh, and take these header structures grown on a, a base gallium arsenide seed wafer. We then leverage you know, traditional microfabrication techniques, lithography, uh, etching, both chemical or wet etching or dry etching, um, to define the lateral coating area. And then I think the one twist we do, but it's becoming more of a sort of routine microfabrication process, is we then direct bond uh, these layers onto uh, the final optic. And I'll, I'll point out the details, sort of the key advancements that, that we came up with in the, in the course of the talk. But in the end, through this nice merger of these two fields, you can you end up with these epitaxial or single crystal multilayers on effectively arbitrary substrates. And for us, one big advancement was the ability to directly bond these structures onto curved surfaces, which is required for a stable optical resonator. Um, so again, rather than uh, evaporation or sputtering, uh, you're taking, again, leveraging all the development work, all the previous efforts into making these uh, low defect density, high purity semiconductor materials and integrating them into a bulk optics uh, application. And one thing I will point out, majority of the talk today is going to be on passive applications. I mean, really using the, the semiconductor as if it's a dielectric, like a sputtered film. But there's a whole different direction where you can leverage the active electro-optic properties of these materials. You know, gain, saturation absorption. You could build a photo detector onto the mirror, right? I mean, you have a, a semiconductor material now that you can integrate onto your, into your bulk optics application. So obviously, this takes a lot of hard work compared to uh, direct deposition. We can achieve uh, phenomenal optical quality, which I'll show uh, in the course of the, the presentation today. Um, so sub-PPM absorption and PPM level scatter. And then beyond that, there's three key advantages. So again, why, why go through all this hard work to do, to do bonding? And the key advantages are uh, the core of what I'll talk about today, and that's the ability to make ultra-low Brownian noise optics. So if you want to make the most stable interferometer, you need a high mechanical quality factor in your, uh, in your optics. And I think this is not obvious to most people. It's a, it's a bit of a... Again, esoteric uh, point. And I'll focus a lot on that today. I'll give a nice conceptual overview of how that works. And hopefully this is the one thing you'll, the one takeaway, the one thing you'll learn uh, today. Maybe some new physics. Um, it also turns out that these materials, are gallium arsenide based materials, have a very wide transparency window. Um, we are precluded from working in the visible because of the band gap of gallium arsenide is about 870 at room temperature. But the transparency window extends to, to 12 microns. So there's the ability to make extremely low loss mid-infrared optics with these systems. And typically, you can get good ion beam sputtered optics in the visible and near IR, but they cut off at about 2 microns. And so going beyond and, and really getting these PPM level of losses um, is, is quite challenging with existing coding technologies. So this is potentially one, uh, one direction to get there. And the other point is because it's a high quality single crystal structure, the thermal conductivity is quite high. So we're looking at in-plane thermal conductivity is as high as 70 to 90 watts per meter Kelvin. Uh, you're sort of phonon scattering limited in the, in the multilayer to about 30 watts per meter Kelvin in, uh, in the multilayer stack there. But compared to a traditional amorphous metal oxide, um, it's about a 30x improvement. You're looking at a little less than one watt per meter Kelvin in a di dielectric mirror. So for high power laser applications, there's some uh, CW specifically, there's some interesting aspects to to having this uh, combination of low optical losses and, and high uh, thermal conductivity. Um, obviously, we're a, we're a commercial enterprise. Our main goal is to, to sell things, bring in money, and continue to develop the technology. We primarily live off of sales, which is, which is nice. The company's been around for about five years. It was founded in 2013, originally in Vienna, and we now have locations in, in Vienna and Santa Barbara. Um, there were about 16 people, you'll see in a second, split across these two time zones. That's why I made this, this joke earlier. Communication is, is quite challenging, but uh, as a small startup, as a small startup in the semiconductor space, where you need a lot of capital equipment and a lot of specialized tooling, which is insanely expensive, there's some advantages to being at these disparate locations. I mean, really, we go where we can just to get access to tooling. That's, that's the, the quickest 
explanation for why we're in uh, Vienna, and it used to be Vienna, Zurich, and Santa Barbara. We look like a jewelry or perfume company or something, if you look at those, those cities, not like a high-tech precision optics company. Um, uh, we have a, a nice growing customer base. Uh, the other thing, we've gotten some nice accolades, just putting this up there, because it's always nice to get some positive feedback, because usually when I hear from people, it's uh, they're not happy about something, <laughs> you know, as always. Um, something broke or doesn't work or isn't sort of uh, up to their standards. So every so often it's nice to get a couple times a year a little pat on the back that like, okay, it was worth it. Um, and usually I keep this slide till the end and then I always forget to put it up after the summary, so I'll put it up now. Like CMS is not just me, there's a whole group of people. And this is a fun picture because uh, we had brought together both sides. So this was the first time the whole team had ever all met, they had all sat together. Um, just because of, well, it's fairly expensive to fly people on sort of, you know, um, transatlantic flights. Uh, so that was a really neat little get together. And so there's the whole team. So again, I may be the face of the company, but there's a lot of other people doing the work here. Uh, now I'll transition to the technical talk, which everybody's super excited about. So um, I'll begin with a quick just introduction into uh, our coding technology, which I've always already touched upon. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the, the Brownian noise topic, really explaining um, uh, how the mechanical quality factor of an optic controls the stability of, a, of an interferometer. Um, I will then sprinkle in some other random points. Uh, something that I think that's interesting takeaway for, for everyone, both on the research side and maybe commercial side. You know, we set out to make these ultra-stable interferometers, but then it turns out the coatings had some other interesting properties. Like I said, good mid-IR performance, high thermal conductivity. It doesn't fit perfectly in the, in the Brownian noise section, but I sort of uh, just shoved that in. Um, then I'll go into uh, some work where we really, you know, early on we knew we had high mechanical quality factor, we had reasonable opt optical performance, and then a lot of work was spent on just fine tuning, pushing the absorption as low as possible, pushing the scatter as low as possible, because we are competing with ion beam sputtering. I mean, this, this is a 40 plus year old technology, it's extremely mature, has very good optical quality, and people want us to get there instantly. We don't have 40 years <laughs> to get there, it's gotta, it's gotta happen right away. And so I'll, I'll show just based on internal uh, metrology, internal characterization efforts, how we've been able to, to significantly improve the performance. And then I'll give an overview of our uh, most recent work, which is pushing to longer and longer wavelengths. And so going from the near IR into the three to five micron space, and then some uh, outlook on how we go beyond that, beyond five microns. So jumping into the first section, you know, it's, it's quite amazing if you think about it. I mean, the, the lasers existed for a little over five decades, right? I guess we're, we're approaching a sixth decade of, of the laser being in existence. And with this tool, there's been phenomenal advance, advancements in metrology, right? So the two most prominent examples are, well, precision measurements of time and space. So on the timekeeping side, you now have uh, these uh, neutral atom lattice clocks or these trapped uh, ion clocks that have reached you know, phenomenal levels of, of uncertainty and stability. So, if you had started one of these clocks, uh, effectively at the, at the inception of the universe, it would have lost less than a second over whatever it is, 14 billion years now. Um, part in 10 to the 18 um, fractional uh, stability there. And um, it's, it's just amazing. In, in a few decades of work, we've gone from uh, uh, having Maiman's first ruby laser to the clock laser that drives this um, strontium transition or aluminum ion transition. And on the spatial measurement side, we have the gravitational wave detectors. Obviously, there's been a lot of this in the news because of the last couple of years, LIGO's been able to routinely directly detect gravitational waves. And these are phenomenal interferometers. These are, you know, kilometer baseline interferometers that are able to detect atometer uh, length fluctuations. So strain, so change in length over length at the 10 to the minus 23 or even approaching 10 to the minus 24 level. And um, so, you know, taking this laser technology and really just push the ultimate limits of, of metrology with this. And it turns out that these two systems are both limited by the, the same basic process, by thermal noise. The Brownian motion of the optics is the, is the key limiter. And in both cases, if you can develop low noise coatings, so uh, say ultra stable coatings, you'll push the, the performance levels of both the clocks and the gravitational wave detectors. Each has their own challenges that I'll go through in, in some uh, uh, level of detail, but it's the same core physics that, that limit the, these systems. And so it's, it's somewhat of a scale independent problem. And you could e extend it even further to the cavity optomechanical systems. The Brownian noise is sort of the bane or limited mechanical quality factor is the bane of all of these, these systems from you know, micron scale up to kilometer uh, length interferometers. And um, it's conceptually simple to understand. I mean, you have an optic that's sitting at some finite temperature, you know, and the thermal bath is constantly pumping the mechanical modes of that body, right? So 
you have this sort of forest of mechanical modes, flexural modes, surface uh, acoustic modes, all kinds of mechanical modes that are actually pumped by the thermal bath. And this is going to, to dither the, the length of that cavity. Um, and the one thing that I think is not uh, immediately obvious is that it's, uh, of course, so these mechanical fluctuations set the stability limit of the cavity. And actually, the magnitude of the Brownian motion is, in terms of its frequency dependence, depends on the mechanical loss angle or the mechanical quality factor of the body. And this will all, all make uh, some more sense of here. So if I take one of those fabry perot reference cavities, so I didn't mention this earlier. In the clock system, the, the thermal noise impact is somewhat indirect. So ultimately, you want your laser line to be as narrow as possible to uh, um, interrogate this, this uh, atomic transition. And you'd like that, that laser line width to be even narrower than the natural uh, line width of your atom. Um, what you do is you take a somewhat noisy kilohertz line with laser and you stabilize it against an ultra stable etalon, an ultra stable reference cavity. And so here's an example of one of those reference cavities. It's a simple Fabry Perot cavity, right? So there's three main parts. There's a rigid spacer that holds the mirrors at a, a fixed separation. And the mirrors consist of a substrate upon which you've applied a high reflectivity coating. There's a bore through the middle of that spacer, so the light's propagating in vacuum. It's not propagating in a solid. So you don't have thermal refractive effects, you just have, well, vacuum there. But again, this thing sits at a finite temperature and the mechanical modes of that body are active. Um, you do everything you can to remove every other noise source in that system. So you shape these things into this funky kind of football shape. So you're holding it at a, a, mechanic, a node of its mechanical resonance uh, there. So you're reducing seismic uh, coupling into that body. You make it the spacer from a material with uh, zero thermal expansion at your operating temperature of interest so that with your finite temperature control, you don't have length fluctuations in the, in the cavity there. And ultimately, you will see the Brownian motion of the, of the system, okay? And um, if you plot the noise power spectral density of that cavity as a function of frequency, and here I'm pulling out just one isolated mechanical resonance of that body, and I'm plotting it with three uh, quality factors shown. So with increasing quality factor going here, and keep in mind, this is one random mechanical mode for that body. I'm probing it way off resonance at, at some low frequency uh, below the mechanical resonance. And um, uh, as you can see, as I increase the mechanical quality factor, I start to pack the noise in and around the resonance, and I pull down the tails. I pull down the off resonant tails. And if I push to some totally uh, unphysical process where the system has no mechanical loss, which is not showing up, <laughs> there'd be a delta function here at resonance. I think the line was a little too light. And so there you would still have, you know, this, I'm showing one isolated mechanical resonance and you'd have your forest of mechanical modes. They would basically have, you know, infinite noise, that delta function on resonance, but they would have no noise off resonance. And you, you're, that's an extreme case, but what you're trying to do is, is sort of shape the noise spectrum to pack all the motion in and around the mechanical resonances and have these quiet regions in between and sort of bring down the off resonant tails at, at DC. So there you can see how if you increase the mechanical quality factor of the system, you can reduce this off resonant noise, um, this off resonant motion there. And that, but that uh, needs to be done for all components of the system, the substrate, the coating, the spacer, right, to, to make this work. And uh, this is relatively recent. So basically you're taking the fluctuation dissipation theorem and applying it into a mechanical system here. It's the same physics that uh, controls Johnson Nyquist noise in a resistor, but in the mechanical domain, if you want to think about it that way. And uh, this work was done, it was really pioneered by LIGO, by this guy Peter Salson from uh, Syracuse. And um, yeah, basically you have a contribution from every uh, mechanical eigenfrequency in the system and you're looking at the summation of all those off resonant tails down at DC. Um, so you can reduce the noise by reducing the temperature, operating in cryogenic uh, um, temperatures. And also this phi uh, point is that's the mechanical loss angle or the inverse of the mechanical quality factor uh, in the system. Okay, those are the sort of important points. Uh, if you look at the actual consequences, so these are sort of busy plots, so I'll walk through it. This is an interesting plot from a paper by Thomas Kessler from PTB. So this is total noise of a reference cavity as a function of material selection. So all the early cavities or the bulk of the early cavities were made from ultra low expansion glass with the thought being that, well, I'm gonna have finite temperature control in the system, so I wanna have zero expansion of every component of that cavity. Um, but then this work by Salson and then applied by this guy Kenji Numata from NASA Goddard showed what you really want to do is increase the mechanical quality factor. And so people switched the substrates shown in black in these, these bar charts we've color coded the noise contribution, changed the substrates out to few silica which has a much higher quality factor and you can see the noise from the substrate drops significantly. And in this plot all the coatings are IM, standard ion beam sputtered coatings 
Uh, these two systems are at uh, room temperature, and this last system is at cryogenic temperature. So in this all silicon cavity, you have ultra high Q for both that, that whole big 21 centimeter bulk piece of single crystal silicon that sits at cryogenic temperatures and the single crystal uh, silicon substrates. And now you're basically left with the coating noise dominating the, the noise of the system. To put it in perspective, the Q of this bulk silicon can be billion level. The mechanical quality factor of the coating is something like a few thousand, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, something like that. So there's a huge discrepancy in mechanical losses uh, in those systems. So really the last frontier is to suppress the, the noise and increase the mechanical loss, or reduce the mechanical loss in the coating. This plot is totally unreadable. I need to one day figure out a way to make this uh, readable, but I'll walk you through it. So this is the noise budget for the advanced LIGO interferometer. So that strain from 10 to the minus 22 to 10 to the minus 24 as a function of frequency, they operate in the audio band that's from 10 hertz to kilohertz. And uh, these are all the different noise uh, uh, components in the system. And the important one to note here is the coding noise. That's that red line there. And purple is the quantum noise. Uh, so it's a mix of shot noise and back action effects in the interferometer. These you can, the, the quantum noise you could tune with squeeze light injection or a back action evading process, but that coating noise uh, line is a hard stop. Until you can increase the mechanical quality factor of the coating, you're not going to push the sensitivity below that, that floor. And so this is something that LIGO has been approaching and will soon sit on uh, once the advanced LIGO interferometer gets up to sort of full operating power. And as I mentioned, you saw on that slide, you know, Salson had looked at this in 1990. In the late 90s, early 2000s, LIGO did a bunch of very methodical work on measuring the quality factor of these coatings. And what they found is that, you know, they could get excellent optical quality, but it's the, the high-index tantalum penoxide films. Um, so these, these mirrors are multi-layers of high and low refractive index materials that are repeating through. And this high-index tantalum material has a, a poor mechanical quality factor. And this is really the limitation uh, in the system. If you have a perfect glass, you can have high mechanical cues. It just turns out that these thin film sputtered systems are not perfect glasses. I won't go into the details uh, of how this works, but you basically have these sort of, um, yeah, you can satisfy a bond condition, but you have um, multiple potential wells for positions that the atoms can sit at, and they'll basically suck up some acoustic energy uh, in the structure there. Um, they've worked very hard to, to reduce the loss angle in this system by actually alloying the tantalum penoxide layer with titania. Uh, titanium dioxide has a higher cube. The problem is it brings uh, additional optical losses. So this fine balance of keeping the optical quality good but uh, increasing the quality factor. And so they've gotten it down by a factor of two since, say, the, the late 90s, early 2000s. And the, our crystalline coating technology is really interesting because we, we're looking at a, a room temperature increase in mechanical quality factor by a factor of 10 and a cryogenic increase of more than a factor of 100. So it's a, you know, it's a significant increase over this sort of factor of two when uh, making small adjustments to the ion beam sputtered films. So I keep mentioning ion beam sputtering as a, you know, these are interference coatings. So as I said, this is a multi-layer of, of um, uh, varying high and low uh, index materials. Uh, this process was developed by Litton Industries for their ring laser gyroscope systems in the mid 1970s. Um, you basically have a, a beam of uh, noble gas ions, either argon or xenon, something like that, impinging on either a fully oxidized target or a metallic target in an oxidizing environment, and you put down amorphous thin films of uh, metal oxides, tantalum penoxide, hafnium oxide, silicon dioxide, aluminum oxide, etc. cetera. Um, phenomenal optical quality, let's say a sub part per million absorption is, is possible. Uh, these are angstrom level RMS roughness, so you know, PPM level scatter. Uh, and the beauty of this process is it's very flexible. I can take almost any substrate. It can be structured, it can be curved, it can be made of silicon, sapphire, or whatever, and I can directly deposit that coating. As long as I can guarantee good adhesion and I have good surface quality on that optic, I'm going to get a good coating on that, on that surface. Um, and so this is the state of the art or sort of gold standard for um, optical interference coatings um, for certain applications, for these low optical loss applications. About the same time in the mid-1970s, the first epitaxial uh, interference coatings or distributed Bragg reflectors were, were developed. And this is, um, of course, like everything at Bell Labs, uh, Van der Zeele and Illigams in the, the mid-70s for these vertical cavity surface emitting laser structures. Um, and these are very interesting. You, there's a lot of work here on vexels, on these external cavity, say, vexel structures. This is a microcavity laser with two uh, Bragg mirrors sandwiching a, a gain medium. And this is all grown in one epitaxial growth process. So you start out with a gallium arsenide seed wafer. You grow the single crystal uh, multilayer, grow the gain medium, grow the second multilayer there. There's a huge commercial industry behind these things. Actually, it's funny because it used to be just laser um, optical mice, 
some short reach data stuff and now because of the next generation iPhone has a facial recognition system based on pixels that's going to swamp everything here. But it used to be 40 million units. I don't know what it's going to be, like some billions of units or something now. Um, so it's, it's an interesting class of these semiconductor lasers because it emits uh, vertically through the surface of the device. You can make them in large 2D arrays, et cetera. So the technology for making interference coatings in the single crystal systems existed since the days, early days of the ion beam sputtered uh, films. But again, it's, it's basically limited from this lattice matching constraint to being grown on a, a lattice match, planar gallium arsenide base wafer. Um, the way that we sort of Morphing this from the Vixel world to the, the large bulk optics, as, as Dahl said, I worked in this caveopto mechanics field. And again, I don't have time to go into the details there, but the idea was you could use the same basic processes, laser cooling processes that you, you would use to cool trapped ions or atoms. You can take a mechanical resonant, resonator and cool an isolated mechanical resonance of, of that system in a detuned optical cavity. Uh, all I'll really say is the basic, basic needs are you want high reflectivity, low optical loss, and very high mechanical quality factor. And here the high mechanical Q is sort of a filter. So it uh, reduces the rate at which phonons leak from the bath into the, into the resonator. Uh, we borrowed from the precision uh, metrology community early on. So we would take just standard sputtered silica tantala multilayers, um, deposit on a silicon wafer, lithographically patterned cantilevers, etch down through that multilayer, scoop out, isotropically etch away the underlying silicon, and you end up with cantilevers of just purely coating material. So this is a little diving board of just the interference coating itself. We can get very nice optical quality. You know, we could get the finesse we needed in our cavity, but we would get these very low cues, cues of a few thousand. And this work was done in the 2006 yeah, to 2008 timeframe. And if we had been smart, like you should, and read the old literature, we would have known that LIGO had already shown in the late 90s that these materials had limited cues, limited mechanical quality factors. For the cavity cooling experiments, we needed much higher cues. We needed cues on the 100,000 and up uh, level. So we were a couple words of magnitude away from where we needed to be. We have a lot more flexibility than, say, LIGO. So we can sort of you know, run through other options in, in terms of materials. So my suggestion was to, to work with these single crystal semiconductors. I knew we could get comparable optical quality. Um, and then it's, the intuition was just, well, it's a high quality single crystal semiconductor. And so the mechanical quality factor, mechanical loss is lower. The quality factor will be higher. Um, so we made a variety of, again, the same sort of one-to-one -one bridge uh, and cantilever structures, and then also some more advanced devices to reduce coupling losses from the clamps to the surrounding environment. And we were able to push the cues up to this sort of, at cryogenic temperatures, I think the highest we measured was at the 250,000 range. So it was a nice improvement over what we saw here. Unbeknownst to me, there was a whole other group of people that cared, like I showed the optical clock people and the gravitational wave folks. And they saw this little, they saw this result with a 50 micron mirror and they said, ah, can you deliver me like, you know, various optics from uh, NIST scale to like LIGO scale. Um, it seemed interesting. The two difficult aspects were they needed curved substrates and uh, well, they wanted to deliver me a piece of few silica and have me do MBE on that surface. It doesn't work. I need a, you know, crystalline seed to do the growth. And so, you know, we know we get this high increase in mechanical quality factors. So in principle, we can make low Brownian noise optics, um, but we can't do direct deposition. So the idea is how do we integrate these, these two things together? And so I had a, a background in, in these uh, sort of high power amplifier and laser structures where we did direct bonding um, to between disparate semiconductor materials. Again, so I knew how to do bonding, but the curvature scared me uh, a little bit. And so the key advances by myself and then now by, by CMS were really the ability to merge these, these high quality single crystal materials onto sort of arbitrary um, curved surfaces. And uh, one thing that's turned out to be sort of lucky was I had some concern early on that every time I switch substrates, I'd have to totally change the process. So bonding to few silica versus silicon versus YAG or something. But it actually turns out to very small tweaks to the process, which is, which is nice. Because in the end, I want it to be just as flexible as direct uh, deposition. Um, we've also worked very high to, hard to push down the background doping in these systems to get ultra low optical absorption, again on par with ion beam sputter films. And um, another interesting aspect is because we separately grow the coating, if you do direct deposition, your coating only gets rougher as you deposit. So you need your substrate as smooth as possible. We can mask high frequency roughness on a substrate. As long as we can mechanically bond, we can recover our angstrom level surface roughness of our crystal on a, a comparably um, you know, imperfect substrate polish. Uh, and that's somewhat interesting. Do you bonding to the very bonding or? So we do plasma-assisted bonding. 
Um, so we, uh, uh, I'll walk through it in a minute because I'm actually just coming up to the. So I, some of you are familiar, some of you aren't, but gas al gas is a well-known material system. It's, it's very well developed, as I pointed out. Interference coatings have been made since the, the mid-70s. And there's been all this work on these uh, Vixel and Vexel structures using the material system. Uh, our high index films are binary gallium arsenide, which has a refractive index, I'll say roughly of three and a half. And the low index is a, a ternary aluminum gallium arsenide alloy, which has a refractive index of about three. So the delta N, the difference in refractive indices is about a half. For those of you who know coatings, that's not great, but it's sufficient for, for uh, uh, many cases. Because our individual refractive indices are so high, actually the total coating stack is not so bad. It looks very comparable. Like an HR stack is about five microns in thickness, which is similar to an ion beam sputtered coating. Um, as I mentioned, the biggest reason this is not applied in the traditional bulk optic application is the fact that you need to, you're constrained by these lattice matching conditions. So to do effective single crystal growth, I need to start with something with the same crystalline symmetry and the same interatomic spacing. So I'm basically stuck with a planar gallium arsenide wafer to do my deposition. Um, so I can't just take an arbitrary substrate. So to get around this, as I've now hammered home many times, we lithographically pattern the, the structures. And there's two ways that we can run the process. I'll show you more details of, uh, of a second process. One way is we'll, we'll define the coating area. It may, it may be a disk or a square or whatever it might be, etched down through the, the multilayer into the substrate. And then we'll basically stick that uh, structure onto a temporary mount, uh, chemically etch away the gallium arsenide wafer, uh, stop on this etch stop, which we'll then remove. And chemically, we can recover a, a roughness of about one angst from RMS after that chemical etching process. And then we can stamp that coating onto an, onto an optic. This works well for smaller optics. If we go up to larger optic size, I'll show a, a variation of the process. Um, here's an example of half inch fused silica with a one meter raised to curvature with little five millimeter diameter coating discs on the, on the surface. Um, because our coatings are birefringent, we have to put, we put small flats so you know where the slow and fast axis of the, of the coating is. Um, we can also make larger parts. Here's an example of a, of a um, uh, this was a 50 millimeter diameter uh, coating on uh, planar fused silica. We're currently limited to a maximum diameter of 20 centimeters, and that's because uh, you can only commercially buy gallium arsenide up to colloquially 8 inch, but say 20 centimeters in diameter. Um, I'll now walk through some more details of the process, and then I'll, I'll touch on your point of the bonding. Um, we typically grow on six inch wafers, so 15 centimeter diameter wafers. This is an example of making uh, larger, roughly two inch optics. We lithographically define basically witness parts and then the four coating discs that we want to punch out of that six inch wafer. We deep etch down into the uh, gallium arsenide substrate, so through the epitaxial layers deep into the substrate, and then we mechanically lap the structure and it'll pop out now these discs. So those of you with a semiconductor background, it's kind of a, a microfab-based coring process where we're cutting the larger wafer down into smaller pieces. But because we're lithographically and chemically etching this, we can do you know, micron scale control on the geometry of, of the devices. Um, this is the final optic we're going to transfer to. It's 24 millimeter thick uh, by roughly two inches in diameter, piece of few silica, um, and has a five meter raised to curvature concave on the, on the top uh, surface there. You can see where we start to deviate a lot. We rely on, on traditional semiconductor microfab tooling. This does not look anything like a wafer. So we have to work, we always have to build custom fixturing and, and modify the tooling because that is not, you know, half a millimeter thick. Um, so we build custom uh, jigs like this that holds the base substrate. This is an older generation where we use basically mechanical spacers to hold the coating off the surface of the, uh, of the base substrate. In this process, rather than putting it onto it, this temporary mount and doing the stamp, we thin the gallium arsenide wafer, as I said, through this backside lapping process that pops out these little dye. So the coating is now facing the bottom. This is the remnant gallium arsenide wafer that's thin to about 100 microns on the backside. We then use a center pin to push the coating into contact with the underlying substrate. And then the bond wave uh, initiates in the center, starts to propagate out, and then we retract those outer pins. This is done in vacuum. There's some pieces of dust here because we had to set it out to take a photo. Um, but being done in vacuum, we can reduce the chance for trapped air voids and this kind of thing in the structure. Before bonding, what we typically do is we strip the, the native gallium arsenide uh, oxide. We grow a controlled oxide that we want in high vacuum, and then we use that as sort of the intermediate layer. But it's a few angstroms thick. Um, but we want to chemically bridge between the few silica and the gallium arsenide. And then we do a post-bond anneal to strengthen the bond. And then in this case, we chemically remove the remainder of the substrate and etch stop on the optic. Um, it 
having this process gives us more structural support than putting it on a piece of like silicone and then stamping off of it. Um, so for small optics, that's fine. For large optics, we start to get some waviness or voids with the silicone process. So here's a, an image of, of the front side of that optic, and that's the back face looking through the thickness of the fused silica at the bond interface between the gallium arsenide and the, and the fused silica. Um, for some of our applications, the, the substrates may be of very high value, so we have to make sure the yield is high in bonding. And it really comes down to cleanliness, just preparing the semiconductor surface, preparing the optical surface to get no, uh, no particles, no debris, nothing in the way there. We've now gotten up to very high levels of optical performance, so absorption less than one part per million, I'll touch on this in a minute, scattered at the few PPM level. We've measured linear cavity finesse over 600,000 in the near infrared, uh, so it's at 1550. And there's uh, some very cool results I'll show later for pushing this into the mid-IR, really PPM level losses in the, in the mid-infrared spectral region. Um, so we've bonded to a variety of substrate materials, silica, silicon, silicon carbide, alumina, YAG, diamond, vanadate. It's, it's really nice. It's turned out to be a much more flexible process than I first imagined. We're limited to a radius of curvature of about 10 centimeters for micron thick coatings. So at one point, we're taking a flat sheet and we're trying to warp it into a, into a spherical uh, bowl shape. It'll start to wrinkle, it'll start to buckle around the edges. Uh, it's not, it's really this buckling instability and not just fracture or something from stress. And as I mentioned, we can uh, make continuous coatings up to 20 centimeters in diameter, limited by the um, uh, availability of commercial gallium arsenide wafers. Um, then we have, uh, you know, basically commercializing the technology. We offer these ultra-stable, low Brownian noise optics, um, the high thermal conductivity optics. All of this is exploiting the same coating technology, but just these advantages of this material system over ion beam sputtered films um, and this uh, low loss mid infrared optics. Just recently started doing some uh, work on uh, laser-induced damage threshold in these materials. Had some nice discussions about this earlier. You know, for, for short pulse, high field uh, um, applications, this is not the ideal material because it has multi-photon absorption. It's a narrow band gap semiconductor. So at one point, you're going to burn the surface, basically. Um, because of the high thermal conductivity and CW applications, it actually can be interesting um, that we've pushed to greater than 50 megawatts per square centimeter in CW and uh, not seen damage on the, on the optics. So short pulse is not ideal, um, but at CW, it's interesting. So 10 centimeters, I don't remember off the top of my head. One meter, it's about, uh, it's sub 100 kilopascals. So if you know film stress, like a, a high film stress is gigapascals, a low film stress was, is in the 100 megapascals and below. So for um, meter scale uh, curvature, the stresses are insanely low. They're kilopascal level. So I think you're, you'd be better off building it in with lattice mismatch than you would be from, from bending the structure. Um, there you can do like yeah, phosphide containing or indium containing compounds and just locally change the lattice constant. There has been work where people have pre-strained structures and then released it so it bows into the shape they want afterwards. There's been some interesting micromechanics devices like that. So you can build in strain gradients to kind of origami the thing into a shape you want. Yeah, that, so we, as I mentioned, we do 8% uh, gallium. So that's a very good point. Uh, ideally, you would want to go aluminum arsenide and gallium arsenide because you get the la largest um, uh, refractive index contrast. Actually, the highest thermal conductivity would be in the aluminum arsenide. Aluminum arsenide is a nasty material that it oxidizes spontaneously in air, tries to turn into aluminum oxide. It shrinks by like 20% and cracks. Um, so we stabilize that material by adding a small, uh, small composition of, of gallium. So we have a ternary aluminum gallium arsenide alloy. Um, from what we've seen so far, it is, you know, the oxidation rate is slow enough from the edges. We don't have any problems. We need to avoid pinholes in the optic because those would be points for oxidation to, to occur. So, but yeah, don't ever do aluminum arsenide if you do 3.5. Um, I'm jumping way back now. So uh, we have this micromechanical resonators. They had very high Q in freestanding form. They had good optical quality, but then there was a little bit of, uh, let's say, some fear that this bonding process or the interface between the semiconductor and the final optic may be the limiter. So maybe we have this beautiful coating material, but if we have this, uh, you know, high friction interface that's slipping and sliding, it could be that this contributes uh, excess uh, loss and excess noise in the system. So after making first prototype optics, we teamed up with June East Group at, at Jilla. We built a compact reference cavity. 
The idea here is if you make the cavity small, um, the fractional uh, length fluctuations uh, get sort of uh, not amplified, but it's, it's, you see this clearly compared to a long cavity. So we built this little 35 millimeter cavity with our two bonded um, gas L gas optics on few silica substrates. Uh, this was at uh, operating uh, wavelength of 1064 nanometers, and we had a reasonable finesse of 150,000. Transmission was quite low, 5 ppm in, in those optics. And the, um, uh, so yeah, transmission was about 5 ppm, and then scatter plus absorption was at 15 ppm. Optical quality was not great. These were some of the first optics we made, and we're really trying to understand uh, what we could do. But it's still, it's, it's a reasonable finesse, and there was enough contrast or enough light coming out of that cavity to make it usable. Um, the interesting point was we built a cavity stabilized laser system with this, and that little 35 millimeter long cavity, after a second of averaging, uh, generate a laser with a line width of 700 millihertz. So that's quite a compact cavity to give a subhertz uh, line width laser. And it turns out that we were looking at a coating loss angle of about four times 10 to the minus five, whereas a typical like run of the mill silica tantala coating would give a, a loss angle of uh, four times 10 to the minus four. So we were solidly 10 times better in terms of loss angle. Um, and if you go to cryo, it gets even better by another order of magnitude. And so if you pull out just the coating noise uh, contribution uh, in that cavity, we had this sort of 10x uh, increase in quality factor, which is what we would expect to see, or what we had seen in the freestanding structures. So the basic point was that the interface was not spoiling the loss of, of the system. You will notice one thing, because we have finite thermal expansion and, and uh, finite thermal refractive coefficient in the material, at high frequency, we start to get this thermal optic noise. So we're no longer following this pure Brownian noise uh, line. But I won't go into it today, but with correct design of the structure, you can make these two effects cancel. And so you can reduce the thermal optic noise. Uh, and we demonstrated that in a paper uh, somewhat recently. There's been some separate confirmation from LIGO. We delivered some two inch optics that they directly measured the thermal noise on. So this is a, um, a tantala silica coating. That's a alloyed titania uh, tantala silica uh, coating. Those were the actual advanced LIGO uh, witness pieces uh, measured against. And then there's our coating. At low frequency, we're clearly, I think it's a factor of uh, four better in loss angle here. The thermal optic noise is starting to kick up at, at higher frequency. So like I said, with this modified design, we should be able to come back down to the Brownian noise curve. And then during our measurement, there was some excess noise that I don't know. I wasn't involved in the measurement. But it's nice to get a ni an independent confirmation of, uh, of the thermal noise in these bonded structures. And that was at a fairly large, again, a two-inch optic. Um, and now we're, here's where I said I would deviate a little bit. Then, you know, what happened was we built those first prototypes for, for June's group that I showed, these little 35 millimeter long cavity. We had a very nice publication in, in Nature Photonics and then had a lot of customers sort of instantly showing up that wanted optics. My plan was not like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move to Austria and, and form a startup company. I'm not gonna leave California to move to Austria to start a company. That's usually not the right direction. But um, uh, we had an instant customer base and so it seemed interesting, well, it, it was a path. It was something interesting to try. So maybe we could, although it's niche, we could try commercializing this. The core of the business it still is and was to make these ultra low brownie noise optics. And then it turned out, you know, in, in random discussions with people, you know, we knew we had high thermal conductivity, but where could this be interesting? turns out in some disk laser applications and some um, uh, kilowatt class like laser processing systems, this high thermal conductivity can be, can be quite interesting. I already pointed all this out, but you know, we're looking at about 30 watts per meter Kelvin compared to at best one watt per meter Kelvin in dielectrics. Um, uh, I did touch on this earlier, but you can also you know, integrate active functionality. So this coating could have saturable absorption. So you can make a CSAM, these semiconductor saturable absorber mirrors. So this is basically a gallium arsenide aluminum, gallium arsenide uh, mirror structure with, uh, these are low temperature quantum wells uh, on the surface there. And this was a collaborative effort between Ursula Keller and Thomas Sudmeyer uh, in Switzerland. And here they're trying to push to very large spot size uh, to keep the intensity down. And this is a kilowatt class mode lock laser. That's the goal, at least. Entry cavity peak power is up to, to 10 megawatts, pushing to 100 megawatts. Um, so again, they want to keep the intensity down on the, on the structure there. So we took CVD silicon carbide substrates, transferred these uh, CSAM structures onto that at the sort of you know, centimeter scale. And uh, the nice thing was because of this direct intimate thermal contact between the, the transferred CSAM and the underlying substrate, you know, we get a smaller temperature rise. We don't see as much thermal lensing in the structure. And so it was uh, quite interesting. This is in, in uh, contrast with the normal like solder mounted uh, CSAM structures. Um, and the final thing is, 
more recently, we've had a bunch of customers that, okay, we can do direct bonding of a variety of materials. So we've started looking into other systems. We did a, a tie sapphire disc laser with a collaborator and even a sandwich diamond tie sapphire disc structure just using our direct bonding process. There's no semiconductor here uh, at all. As long as the micro roughness is below about a nanometer and the surface figure is at the lambda over 10 level, we can typically bond. There's some chemical, you know, some surface chemistry stuff that precludes bonding, but in most cases, as long as you meet these, these sort of physical surface quality uh, uh, constraints, you can stick two things together. Um, and uh, this was an, another interesting point where we did silicon carbide clad uh, semiconductor gain medium for some high power Vexel uh, applications. So interesting. I mean, primarily we do the, the you know, ultra stable optics, but then we have some sort of side paths in doing these uh, the custom bonding efforts. I'll now go through the, the high performance interferometer, so really pushing the optical quality. You know, that first prototype interferometer had a finesse of about 150,000 um, with relatively high losses. We've now worked very hard to push the absorption below one part per million. I wish I had like an exciting scientific outcome for how we did that, but it just turned out, just be careful. <laughs> um, make sure the MB chamber's clean and then grow as fast as you can because you're always going to have a flux of, of stuff in the background. And so just get those layers down before that flux of stuff is incorporated into the structure. Um, the one thing we fight with, there's two growth uh, processes for doing these epitaxial arsenide structures. There's MOCVD, these metal organic chemical vapor deposition processes, or molecular beam epitaxy. MOCVD, the problem is the MO, the metal organic. There are these long organic molecules with carbon backbones, and the carbon ends up being incorporated in the gallium arsenide. That's a P-type dopant that's an acceptor in gallium arsenide, and it absorbs fairly nastily for us. So we have to stick with MB. The drawback of MBE is we can get ultra-low background doping, but we get small nodules, these sort of uh, oval defects or these small spitted uh, clumps of material. And so we fight with scatter uh, in MBE grown material. And that that's, seems to be unavoidable at this point. So we modify the, the, the microfab process, either adding polishing steps or, or burying those defects at the bond interface. Um, but with a lot of work, we've been able to push, like I said, to less than one part per million absorption. This is a direct PCI measurement. I'll make sense of that in a minute. And then we've, we've built up some very cool capabilities for scanning ring down, where we can take the optic, raster it, tip tilt it, and, and hold the um, fundamental mode of a linear cavity as a function of position, and really map out the optical losses in ring down. Um, so here's this PCI technique. It's very cool. I just thought I'd throw this out there. It's a photothermal common path interferometry. So you take your material of interest. It could be a bulk material or a thin film. You pump it at the wavelength of interest where you want to measure absorption. Uh, usually with a watt level uh, laser, it could be hundreds of milliwatts. Um, you chop that and you get a time modulated thermal lens formed by the absorption of the sample. If you're on a known substrate, and there's ways to calibrate this that I won't go into, uh, you just need to know the, the, the thermomechanical properties of the substrate. So choose something like fused silica, which you know. Um, you have this very thin film absorber where all the heat's dumping into the, the fused silica substrate and you're primarily seeing the thermal lens from the substrate. And then you have a probe beam that interferometrically reads out the, uh, the displacement of that thermal lens. And you can, you can measure to subparts per million uh, the absorption in, in these structures. So we have a custom PCI system built by this company, Stanford Photothermal Solutions, which is a spinoff of LIGO. Um, so we have a system that operates at 1064, uh, a couple other intermediate wavelengths, and then in the mid-infrared at 3.8 and 4.5 uh, microns. Uh, it's, it's very neat. So now we can get real-time feedback, like grow a coating, put it in the PCI system. Even on wafer, we can directly, we've calibrated gallium arsenide, so we can directly measure the absorption and then kind of feed back to clean up the, the growth process. Uh, this was a very cool result. This is a 3.8 micron optic that we measured less than two parts per million of absorption. So this is a plot, it's a six millimeter thick substrate, and we're scanning through the thickness of the substrate. That's the background absorption in the fused silica, and there's a little peak from the coating sitting on the surface. And we can constrain that coating to something on the order of two parts per million absorption. In the mid-IR, that's, that's a phenomenally low level of absorption. It looks like repeatedly we can do sort of 10 to 20 uh, parts per million of absorption in the mid-IR. Uh, then our scanning ring down system, we uh, have a very uh, nice staff member, Garwing Truong, who came from Nate Newberry's group at uh, NIST. And he built this very cool um, scanning ring down system for us. So we basically have the, the two optics, say planar and curved, and we will displace the, the curved optic then pitch it back uh, into alignment with, uh, with the planar optic and maintain the fundamental mode of that cavity. And we can now do scanning ring down uh, on the system. It's in a uh, vacuum chamber with these X, Y, and tip tilt uh, mounts. And Garwing has a really nice uh, uh, program to automatically scan the optic, 
um, and generate these 2D maps of finesse as a function of position. And from this, we can pull out bounds on the optical loss. Um, one very nice thing about the single crystal semiconductor systems is uh, the refractive indices are effectively fixed by nature. They don't vary like from run to run with the sputtering process, so we know our indices. We can do x-ray measurements of the film thickness. We can measure the super lattice, fit the peaks. We know our transmission. Uh, we can now uh, measure the absorption by PCI. And then the ring down is everything. It samples transmission, scatter, and absorption. So we're just left with scatter as the one unknown. Um, so we can map out scatter. We can scan the PCI system for absorption. We can do very, very high level um, uh, characterization of the optics. And uh, this is what it takes, though, to get to you know, these levels of performance quickly and yeah. catch up with IBS instead of waiting uh, a couple of decades. Um, we can now build a variety of reference cavities. So we have optical contacting capabilities in house. We work with a couple. Um, local providers, Coastline Optics in Camarillo, Mindrum Precision, and uh, I think they're in Rancho Cucamonga, I apologize for forgetting that. Um, so they'll do our Insico for giant sapphire spacers, um, machine the spacers, deliver it to us, and then we'll do the full assembly. So we can characterize the individual optics, if we're happy with them, contact them onto the spacer, qualify the full cavity for the customer, and then ship it. Um, so we've done lengths up to 30 centimeters long, uh, with a very beautiful spherical cavity. <laughs> that one was probably the prettiest cavity we had. Uh, this is a space-based cavity for, uh, for Airbus. Um, and yeah, really cool. That's a four Kelvin sapphire cavity that's 20 centimeters in length. That one's extremely cool. Um, and I'll go into detail on this, this silicon cavity. So you saw this in the theoretical plot earlier where the coating noise was the main limitation. So now we take our gas al gas coating, transfer it to the surface of that uh, single crystal silicon substrate. This is amazing to me that as a hunk of single crystal silicon with a central vacuum bore. Um, and then these optics are flipped and contacted onto it. Uh, that is then put in, uh, their silicon weirdly crosses uh, zero thermal expansion at 124 Kelvin and at 18 Kelvin. So you can operate at 124 Kelvin with zero thermal expansion in silicon. Um, and uh, so that's a, you know, a very nice point of stability. And this thing at uh, 124 Kelvin would have a fractional frequency instability on the order of one part in 10 to the 17. So it's, some, it's either single digit millihertz or sub millihertz line with laser, one second of averaging. So it's really incredible. And that sapphire cavity I showed earlier, I think is, goes even better into the part in 10 to the 18. So if you're looking at coherence time of these lasers, it's minutes, right? So you're starting to measure the, the coherence length in terms of astronomical units of these, um, of these uh, laser systems. But I mean, this is what it takes to make better and better clocks. So. Uh, we built a, a test cavity on single crystal silicon spacer that was uh, 10 centimeters in length and then measured the finesse. One tough thing we have is because of the, the thermal refractive effect, we have to redshift and design the mirrors for a longer wavelength than they're intended at cryogenic temperatures because as they cool, the, the um, center wavelength shifts. So this was made to operate at 124 Kelvin in the zero crossing in silicon. So we tuned the transmission so that it uh, walks on to minimum transmission as it cools down to 124 K. But we got very nice results, 400,000 finesse, um, and we're totally transmission dominated in this system. So good co cavity contrast there. And uh, yeah, very excited to see results on, on those cavities. Those are deployed out PTB and Jilla. Um, another thing, and it's an interesting topic, but you know, another customer of interest or person of, of interest, group of interest is LIGO. You know, can we do ultra low Brownian noise, large optics? Size scaling is really challenging here, right? I mean, they have 35 centimeter optics. I keep showing little one inch optics. You know, that optic is bigger than that person's head, not like his eyeball. So, you know, we've proven this very nice optomechanical performance at sort of the inch uh, scale, but can we scale up to this large? And we've got to maintain, you know, sub PPM absorption and low scatter and high uniformity. The one nice thing though, is that, you know, we rely on semiconductor microfab uh, capabilities and they're always scaling, right? Silicon now, I mean, the next rung for silicon is 45 centimeters. It's 18 inches in diameter. And um, so there's tooling that exists to, to do this. So I'll just touch on it uh, quickly here. But yeah, there are commercial tools that you can leverage to do this work. Gallium arsenide wafers currently exist at 20 centimeters, but there are crystal pulling systems that'll grow up to 40 uh, centimeter ga diameter gallium arsenide bools. It just takes a lot of money. Um, there are epitaxial growth systems. These uh, production chambers are 50 to 60 centimeters in, in diameter. The uniformity looks good enough to do, if that wafer could be produced, popped into the machine, that you could grow it at high enough uh, uniformity. And then you need to modify the bonding systems. There are currently silicon on insulator wafers. So these are silicon oxide silicon stacks made by bonding up to 18 inches or 45 centimeters in diameter. But again, they accept wafers. They're made for standard semiconductor wafers, not a test mass that's 20 centimeters in thickness. 
so that has to be modified. But the pieces are in place to do it. It's just very capitally, uh, capital equipment intensive. That's, that's the biggest roadblock here. Um, and the final section I'll touch on briefly is a recent work on these prototype mid-infrared reflectors. So, um, you know, there's sort of this new frontier of pushing into the mid-IR. You have all this, you know, beautiful capabilities in the, in the near-IR, and let's extend this out to, say, 3 to 10 to 12 microns. Um, you can do direct, you know, uh, this is the fingerprint region of uh, sort of uh, atomic spectroscopy where you can differentiate all these row vibrational modes of, of atoms and molecules of interest. And um, one nice thing about gallium arsenide is it's, uh, you, this was a Google image search for gallium arsenide windows for mid-IR systems, and that's transmittance as a function of wavelength, and it starts to dip at about 12 microns. But that transparency window is wide. But then the question is, this is percent level, so how low are the optical losses in the system in reality when you're looking at PPM levels of losses? So a couple of years ago, did a quick theoretical exercise. So this is absorption as a function of, of various mirror designs. So a bunch of quarter wave mirror structures that are interpolated together to make that uh, the total mirror loss in absorption. So there's dispersion is taken into account here. The change in absorption coefficient is a function of wavelength from these beautiful old papers, right? This 1959 paper that just studied the crap out of the absorption coefficient in gallium arsenide as a function of doping and wavelength. Um, we're assuming, uh, we're looking at the change in, in uh, penetration depth, and then we're assuming an n-type background, which we ideally want in our MB grow material. Obviously, the band edge cuts us off at, uh, at 870, and then we have this plateau from these intraband processes from the, the global minima to these local 111 minima that give us sort of finite absorption there. And then the penetration depth kicks up. So as the mirrors get thicker, the field penetration is a little deeper. So there's a slight tilt here. And then free carrier absorption is the killer as you go to longer wavelengths. The lower you can get the free carrier absorption, the better you're going to be. You can start to pull that arm down. Um, but you can already see those are promising numbers. That's 100 ppm of absorption out to you know, 7.5 microns, which is, is actually quite good. And you can maintain sub 30, 40, 50, 20 ppm absorption out to 4 or 5 microns, which is extremely nice. You can imagine making 100,000 finesse type cavities out to 4 or 5 microns. Um, so we've made some prototype uh, optics. The nice thing is we had to do all this work to do high bond strength between gallium arsenide and silicon for the cryogenic systems. So we can leverage that here to make the mid-IR optics. So we get float zone, high resistivity bulk silicon, polished into the, the end uh, substrate, and then we put our gas gas coatings on the surface. Um, we've made a variety of, of structures. There's a 3.7, 3.8 micron uh, optic measured by FTIR. Um, and early on, we didn't, actually, this is going to go slightly out of order. The first optics we made were at 3.8 uh, microns, and we didn't know what sort of losses we would have, so we put the transmission very high. Um, then we stepped back to 3.3 set the transmission at 200 ppm and targeted a finesse of uh, a little over 10,000. We got to 11,000 finesse. Uh, losses are in the, say, tens of ppm uh, level, approaching 100 ppm for these initial optics. And these are totally transmission limited. We were shooting for 5,000 finesse and got 4,200. And I'll quantify it a little more in these recent uh, 4.5 micron optics. This is brand new results from the last week. So I just stole this from a, a colleague. So he may, actually he doesn't know that I'm <laughs> showing this. So there's a bunch of like different curves. But that is finesse as a function of wavelength. It's very nice. He took a QCL that he bought from Thor Labs, and it has this very nasty spectrum. I mean, that's not a nice laser spectrum. But at the same time, he has a bunch of, I won't call it comb teeth, because it's not comb teeth, but a bunch of lines he can use to sample. So what he did was just feed all of this sort of wide spectrum into the cavity, and then post-selected the wavelength he wanted to measure and ring down on the, on the output side, which was really smart. And then you can select out like the uh, finesse as a function of wavelength. And uh, the losses we got down to total losses on the order of 200 parts per million. And in this optic, the transmission is 160 parts per million. So we have uh, scatter plus absorption or excess losses beyond transmission capped at 40 ppm. There's still some parasitic absorption in the path. Um, so we're looking at sub 40 parts per million of, of excess loss. Our, our, we're aiming for something like 20 to 30 ppm of excess loss. And if you build, bring the transmission down, then you can shoot for... 50, 60, 70,000 finesse in the cavity, with the next step trying to go to 100,000 finesse cavity at 4.5 microns. Um, but these losses are you know, beyond or state-of-the-art for mid-IR uh, reflectors. Um, even our first prototypes, it was very nice to get some, some cool scientific output. So this work was also done in collaboration with June's group at uh, Jilla. So we supplied our 3.7 micron mirrors uh, for an atmospheric chemistry experiment where they were looking for uh, this uh, atmospheric intermediate transdoco. I'll let you read the paper because I'm not an atmospheric chemist. Um, 
but it was very nice. You know, we had this DARPA ceiling project, made these first shot uh, prototype optics and got some very cool new science out of it. Um, and here's going back to that theoretical curve. This is two different doping levels, 5 times 10 to the 14 n-type and less than 1 times 10 to the 14. We don't reliably get this. The problem is uh, from the foundries, uh, we can't control what was grown before, and the systems inherently have dopants in them. Um, but on good runs, we can push down to this sub-1 ppm uh, in the near IR, and we've shown uh, down to single-digit ppm uh, out to 3.8 microns. And really minimizing background doping is the key. You want a, an MBE system with no dopants, just gallium, aluminum, and arsenic. Um, that's the last slide, and that took a little bit of time. But um, summary and conclusions, again, the benefits of this material system, the benefits of merging these compound semiconductor materials and bulk optics is our, you can get high optical quality with these additional advantages of uh, the high mechanical quality factors, uh, very good uh, optical performance in the mid-infrared and high thermal conductivity for uh, these kilowatt class laser machining systems. So thank you very much for your attention and obviously he's open to questions whenever you're ready.